So where I want to talk about Roman escort, and if you look at the timeline, first of all, you'll see that it runs between about 800 to 1150. And then the Gothic era kind of takes over, but the periods really overlap the early Christian with the Romanesque and the Romanesque with the Gothic. So keep that in mind. In order to understand architecture, and we're going to start with architecture in the Romanesque period, you need to know about the different kind of cross plans. And so I got this diagram out of Marilyn Stockstad's art history. And so in the upper left hand corner, you can see that there's a Latin cross, which is basically looks like lowercase t. The Greek cross is actually the plan that we'll be referring to as the central plan, uh, which is basically an even sided cross, almost like the Red Cross symbol. And then we have the Tau plan, which looks like a capital T. In the period that we're going to be looking at right now, it's really going to be closer to the Tau plan or to the Latin cross plan. The other uh, crosses that you see here, St. Peter's, it's, it's not a symbol of demonic stuff. It's just basically because St. Peter, uh, the legend has it that he was crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy. And then the sort of television antennas of the Russian papal ones are just kind of corrections on the original schema. So the most important ones are the Latin one, the Greek one, and the Tau plan. And those are the basic footprints of some of the buildings that we'll be looking at. So that's why I wanted to bring that up to you. When studying architecture, you need to first look at the evolution. So we're looking at the first St. Peter's that was really built around 315, 350 common era and built under basically Constantine's patronage up on the Vatican Hill, and it's the first St. Peter's. This St. Peter's doesn't exist anymore because in around 1500 in the Renaissance, they reconstructed it and made a bigger, grander building. But if you look at this building, the first thing that I want you to notice is it looks like the towel plan that we looked at first of all. It's a, a basically a square building. It has an apse on one end, and then this crossing thing that makes the T at the top is called a transept because it it uh, transverses the main building. Then you have a nave, which is the center of the building. And it comes from a shipbuilding term. I think it's Latin for the hull of a ship. And if you look at a roof, it looks like an upside down hull of a ship. Uh, then you have the side aisles. And then you usually have an atrium out front. So we studied the original St. Peter's plan. It's a towel plan. You have an apse on the end. And then on either end of the transept, you would have apses as well so that they would be able to move from apse to apse. Part of this is the superstition of the age and, and extends well into, I think, the 16 and 1700s, where there was a sort of superstition that if you went and worshipped and you uh, witnessed the um, you witnessed a service and you actually witnessed the transfiguration of the host, you know, when they did the sacraments, you couldn't die that day. Also, the other thing to keep in mind is that they didn't have pews or benches in the churches and people did not go up and take the sacraments, the wine and the wafer. That evolves really probably out of the floor plan. So having several apses uh, in either end of the left and the right of the transept is a way of leaving a an apse or an altar that hasn't been used once during the day. And I believe that one of the superstitions was that you needed to actually go from altar to altar because it was almost like you used one altar and then you needed it needed to regenerate itself somehow um, in terms of its religious power. The atrium in the front was so that pilgrims could come and wash their feet and, uh, and get comfortable. And in fact, it's not like the church that we have today. I think people actually slept in the atrium and often slept inside the, um, the nave of the church and the side aisles. Uh, it was a much more lively place than the churches are today. And they sometimes had as many as uh, three to five services a day. The Romanesque plan of the church is more or less based on the early Christian version of the church as well. So if you look at this Romanesque plan compared to, for instance, St. Peter's on the right-hand side, you can see it has the same general construction. However, it's made out of slightly fancier materials in the Romanesque era. It's made mainly out of stone and, um, and sort of brick and mortar. So you still have the nave and you have two side aisles, but in the Romanesque era, instead of having a flat timbered roof as in the original St. Peter's, one of the things that you would have is barrel vaults that run down the entire length of the building, which means that the Clara story, which is that top level, and I'll point out it here. This is where the Clara story would be. There are rows of small windows. That Clara story doesn't rise very high, and you can see it doesn't rise very high also in the um, Romanesque style. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning that is 
the Romanesque style is sort of a, a short, flat, uh, stocky, almost castle-like building. So we're going to go to the Pyrenees to look at a Romanesque, a typical Romanesque style church that we can see that is the beginning of the Romanesque era, more or less, and how churches were built. So we're going to go to uh, Catalonia, um, we're going to go to, to Spain, and we're going to look at a Romanesque uh, style church, St. Vincen uh, in Cardona, and it's really, if you look at it, it's located on a mountain, and I believe that the reason for this probably is that it is built almost like a fortress, and people would run up to the churches and lock the doors, and so the the big flat masonry would make a lot of sense in terms of what they would be wanting to build and how they would want to defend themselves. And so we're going to look at the geographic region where it's in. It's between Spain and France, which makes it kind of a perfect Romanesque area because it's almost Southern and it's Roman-like. So the term Romanesque is kind of like when we studied Arab-esque. It just means it's kind of Roman looking, but it's not really in the classical Roman style. The building itself is very blocky. It's very stocky. It has very small windows. You wouldn't have a lot of light flooding in. Uh, it was uh, a very defensible building, and it incorporates the use of barrel vaults uh, running throughout it, just like on the Colosseum, just like in the Roman triumphal arches. It does have a round apse at the end, and so we're going to look at the floor plan next. So the biggest ideas are it's large um, blocks of stone that would be um, really tough to move at first, but would make the building very sturdy. It's low, it's squat, it's flat, and it incorporates a lot of uh, Romanesque or, or Roman style barrel vaults running through it. The floor plan is not actually a towel plan. It's more of a basilican plan. So if we look at these two sections, uh, the, the floor plan on the left, the footprint of the building, you can actually see that it's really not a cruciform type of building. It, it looks almost more like uh, the Basilica of Constantine and Maxentius. It does have three apses at the end. And whenever you see a little cross in there, you can that's actually an intersecting barrel vault, which is a groin vault. And in this building in particular, they actually even have a little bit of extra ribbing on it. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more depth. So we have a, a main nave, two side aisles, and three main big altars. And then there's actually underneath it a crypt that was built in that makes it a little bit larger. So let's take a look at the nave and look at the architecture of the nave and, the, uh, and how this building would look on the interior structure. You can actually see that it is a basically a sort of tunnel like structure uh, at the end of it it actually has a little bit of a dome with small windows located near the top of it so it does allow for some lighting in and what's kind of neat about the uh the photograph on the right hand side is you can actually see that they needed to move chairs in for worship because that's the contemporary style and one of the other things that they have is that on the left and the right hand sides of the arches and i'll point at those right here right here you see actually strips of masonry attached to what these are kind of called piers you can see it here and here as well and these strips actually reinforce the wall and are referred to as st strip buttresses so let's take a look up at the ceiling and you can actually see how the structure looks up at the ceiling so this is the nave ceiling and you can see that it actually has um, sort of intersecting herringbone patterns of, of masonry of bricks that have been laid up there. They probably would have built that on top of a wooden uh, scaffolding that would have been built way up high. And then you see again the barrel vaults that are reinforced between the, the, the groin vaults. So this is a groin vault right here with this X that, that's intersecting. And this would be sort of strip buttressing buttressing that would make the arches a little bit stronger. We actually see extras of this. The interior is not really decorated. It's a very simple building, but it's meant to be very large and very austere and very strong. And so it wouldn't have burnt down. It would have been um, very permanent. And later on, that's going to evolve and the building is going to become taller. But you can see that it's a short squat sort of unornamented building. And then underneath it, it has a series of crypts that incorporate barrel vaults. 
So we're looking at the crypt, which is down here on the lower right hand side, and you can actually see that it's a series of barrel vaults that run underneath the main altar. Now the reason why I want to talk about this a little bit is uh, actually, you've ever heard the term the stinking rich? Well, the crypts were buried underneath the altar because the rich people would be have enough money to give to the church to be buried underneath the altar. And of course, before their bodies uh, completely putrefied and, and desiccated, um, the their their corporeal remains would would rot and smell and that's where we get the term stinking rich from now what i want to do is go back to france uh which is um where a lot of the churches were built and the reason why big churches and cathedrals were built was more or less for the idea of um they would become part of a pilgrimage the tourist trade would increase uh it would be a place that would call people to worship and would help them economically and so cathedrals are actually the seat of the bishop. It comes from the term cathedra, which means the, the seat. And any large building that is the main church where the bishop presided would be called a cathedral. So you're going to see that there are a lot of cathedrals in, in main cities. And what I want to do is talk about Romanesque sculpture that would be used on churches. Now, what we're looking at is a diagram of a typical Romanesque church portal, and a portal is just basically a place that transports you into the heavenly realm of the church, just like in sci-fi games and video games, you have these portals and that kind of thing. And the diagram here kind of outlines, and I got this out of Marilyn Stockstad's Art History, you can actually see that you have a series of, of decorative elements called archivolts and voussoirs, which are the, basically the little the little bolts that in between. And it's modeled somewhat on a Roman triumphal arch, but it's Roman-esque. It's not Roman in style because it's too ornamented. It actually has a lot of Byzantine influence. What we're going to be zooming in on first uh, is actually what's called the tympanum, which is the center of the building there. And when we actually talk about later buildings, when we get to the Gothic era, we're going to be looking at the jams and the jam figures and the pedestals and that kind of thing. But what I want to do is focus really on the tympanum. And the term tympanum essentially comes out of, uh, you know, in your ear, you have a tympanic membrane. Uh, a tympani uh, is a reference to drumming and the membrane that runs across the top of a drum. So it's basically a membrane or a, uh, um, a sort of um, ornament that covers the portal on the top in that arch. And I, what I want you to think about is the fact that the arch is an honorific term, right? And so it comes basically evolves first from Roman triumphal arches. And so they're still thinking of it in their subconscious. Anything that has an arch in it is actually a symbol of something that's triumphant or wonderful. So it'd be appropriate to make a doorway into a church, a Roman triumphal arch. And so in the tympanum that we're going to be studying next, we're going to see a scene that's meant to educate. It's didactic. It's meant to instruct people in how they should behave and how they should perceive Christian ideas. This is the west portal of Saint Lazare in Autun Cathedral in France. And we're looking at the west portal sculpted by a sculptor named Gisli Berdus. Um, I've also heard it pronounced Gisel Berdus. Um, and I think that as a memory device, you can remember him as Grizzly Barris, um, and he is the sculptor who designed this. Originally, this probably would have been painted, I think, with tempera paint, not encaustic, and it shows a scene of the Last Judgment. So we're going to zoom in on the tympanum, that sort of archway form, and we're going to look at what it depicts. We're zooming in on the Last Judgment uh, tympanum, and what we see overall is basically a lot of ornamentation, even including zodi um, zodiac symbols around the edge. Now, they would not have thought uh, zodiac symbols and astrological symbols would have been at odds with the idea of Christianity, and let me explain that to you first. Basically, the seasons change, and um, astrology was considered a kind of science at that point in time, and God was a divine geometer, a divine scientist who designed the planet and designed the world. So the fact that he gave us a system that we could figure out that included astrological symbols 
would have um, been proof of how orderly the universe is and how God ordered those things. So it would have been would not have been considered uh, witchcraft. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is we zoom in a little bit or we look at that central archway and it shows a scene from one of the last chapters of the Bible that has to do with the last judgment. Now, in terms of Catholic and Christian um, re of the Catholic and Christian re religion, people actually don't get to go to heaven until the last judgment happens, until we're actually all of us judged and that uh, and the rapture happens and all that kind of stuff. And so what they're kind of doing is showing you this scene that's meant to be both scary and instructive to tell you that you need to get right with God while you're on this planet now because something is going to happen when God comes back and judges us all. So this is really a map or a uh, diagram of how the last judgment will occur and what kinds of things will happen. Now the basic organization of it, we have a top to bottom and a left to right organization in terms of the importance. And what I want to stress is first, you have this massive figure of Jesus in the center who's seated on a throne. It almost looks like he's doing the Charleston here. And he is the largest figure and he is in the center of the composition. So those two things, the hierarchic scale and the fact that he is in the center of the composition, call attention to him and make him the most important figure. On the bottom is actually where we are. So I'm going to point at that with my cursor. And the left and the right-hand sides, it's actually us being lifted up to judgment. So this is the planet Earth now. On the To the right of Jesus, on his right-hand side, is St. Peter and the elect being, being judged and being ushered into heaven. On the left is actually the scales of judgment. So the left of Jesus is not so cool. It's, it's we're waiting to have things happen. And then the people who are being transported or dragged down to hell. So anything on the left-hand side of Jesus is actually a little bit negative, the left-hand side. The right-hand side, you're his right-hand man, and there's St. Peter. Now, like cream, everything rises. So on the top level, everything is good. That's the realm of heaven. So we've kind of got this idea of a hierarchic uh, construction where the most important figure is the largest and in the center. We have a right-hand side, which is the saved, and it's the right-hand side of Jesus, not our right. And the left-hand side indicates damned, and we can actually see that with the scales because the demons are on the right-hand side. And the very top level, like cream, floats to the top. That's the realm of heaven. So we're going to zoom in a little bit on some of these details and talk a little bit more about it. What we're looking at here in this scene is actually this little left-hand area right down on the bottom. And what's happening is actually people are being lifted out of their graves and, and the angels are lifting them up. And you can see that there are these sort of good shepherd symbols. Uh, we, we see these uh, shepherd crooks, I think they're called. And the angels are lifting people up to be judged by God. And so we have this scene in which people who have been Christians their lives are being lifted up and God is going to make a final judgment on them. And that is in this lower left-hand area, the elect rising. Above that, right here in this area, is Peter. And this is St. Peter, and you can see in his hand, I'm pointing at it with the cursor. He has the keys to heaven, and it looks like a big antique key. And he is actually um, has the people who are coming to him to be judged, and they are being ushered in. Now, above him, right over here, is the city of God, which really relates to uh, St. Augustine. And there's a text that has to do with the city of God and the city of man. The city of man is a temporary kind of place, and the city of God is eternal and lasts forever. And if you look closer at this diagram, one of the things that you'll actually see is that the angels are blowing their horns and that some of the people who are being uh, judged by Peter are hiding in the angel's skirts. And then sort of as a continuous narrative right behind Peter, he's actually ushering the people into the right hand side, uh, into God, into Jesus's realm, and they will be lifted up into heaven. So let's go to another area. Down here in this lower right hand court quarter, which is the lower left hand, we have people lifted up 
by this gigantic hand and they're being lifted up into the scales of judgment. You can see it's kind of a scary thing and it's meant to chasten you and make you think about what might happen. Now one of the other elements that I want you to notice is there's actually a Latin inscription. Now, I don't want you to get the feeling that actually more than probably 5% of the population and maybe that's even an overestimate could read, but we're starting to see that uh, writing is kind of becoming important at this, at this point in time. So this is a figure who's being pulled up to judgment. So let's go to the judgment scene. And, you know, just to relate this to an earlier work of art we looked at, remember when we studied Egypt, there was the last judgment of Hunifer and scales of judgment, and you were being weighed against the feather from the, uh, the goddess of, uh, of justice, Ma'ad. And uh, in this instance, the same kind of symbol occurs. And we have the angels on our left-hand side who are trying to pull the scales down in favor uh, to save people. So they're trying to save people. And then you have these really scary demons who are actually kind of jumping up and down on one side and pulling down on the scales because they're trying to pull people into hell. And on the far right hand side, you can actually see that some people who have not passed judgment are being pulled into hell by the demons as well. So this is really meant to scare you to Jesus. It's meant to make you um, pay attention to your life on this earth. And um, an interesting kind of comic element there in the lower left hand corner of the scene, you can actually see that some of us who are the people who are being judged are hiding in the angel's skirts trying to get away from judgment. Now, one of the other things that I should mention about Romanesque art and Romanesque sculpture is um, it is very, very flat looking. There's not a lot of overlapping. It's not naturalistic. It's just meant to be a sort of cartoon that scares you and makes you think and makes you really think about what's going to happen to you. So naturalism is not important. It's actually meant to be just communicative, communicate ideas, and educate. Now what we're looking at here is the upper right-hand portion, which is uh, Jesus's upper left, and notice that we have a scene in which Mary is actually talking to one of the apostles, and she is actually kind of interceding on our behalf, and I think that's kind of important. We have these, these apostles who are actually talking to one another who will communicate to Jesus that we need to be saved. Now, the Romanesque style, uh, as I stated before, is very cartoon, um, and so we have Paul here trying to save the last people, and then what we're going to have um, on the column tops, the capitals of the columns, are actually cartoon and diagrammatic style communications of big ideas that have to do with the New Testament. So let's take a look at one of the capitals of one of the columns in uh, Saint-Lazare in Autant Cathedral in France. The capital that we're looking at here makes a lot of sense. If you look at it, it's basically all of the story elements without any reference to pictorial space at all. We're, we're not trying to tell a story in an illusionistic way. What you have is the Star of Bethlehem floating above these three characters who are in bed, and these are the three wise men who are being called by the angel, and she is our, the, the angel actually is kind of uh, genderless, is pointing up at the star and telling them, get up out of bed because a new age has dawned. And so we have the major elements, these, these angel uh, figures that are messengers that are delivering the message to the three wise men and then the star of Bethlehem, which is basically the story of Christmas. Now, the last thing that I'd like to do is kind of talk about how this relates to the Byzantine tradition of making art. What we're looking at here is a um, mosaic from San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy, from a, a really the middle of the 6th century, around 525 uh, to 550. And you can see that it's actually a little bit more realistic. So one of the ideas about the evolution or the schema and correction, how art changes over time between the 6th century into the 8th and 9th centuries and really into the 1100s, is that things are going to become less realistic over time and more didactic, more communicative. But the compositional elements that we're looking at from San Vitale, I think, are really important. So when we see um, Emperor Justinian, he is in the center of the composition, he's in the center of the picture, and he actually is slightly larger than the other characters. The drapery is um, less realistic, everything is more cartoony, there's no sense of weight or gravity in the figure, and then 
on his right hand side, which I think is actually very interesting, are, is more or less his military uh, leaders. And uh, he is flanked by the people in his church, but to the left and the right, but on his right hand side is actually the army. And uh, we can see the Cairo on their uh, shield in the on the far left hand side. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the evolution of the composition and the and the way naturalism occurs is in direct relationship to what kind of message is being communicated. And Constantine and Justinian wanted to be in the center of their images and be the head honcho and be the most important character. And we see that that translates into the Last Judgment as well.